All right, welcome those who are just joining us for the uh, jumping art tonight. Just give us another minute while we let others in and we'll get started very shortly. Thanks everybody for joining in on time. Just give us another minute or two to let other people find the link and, and hop on the call and we'll get started very shortly. All right, so we have 20 folks in here and I'm sure join or more will join as we get started um, and people log on, but welcome everybody to tonight's Jumpstart Germantown Jumpinar, uh, which is our weekly uh, or bi-weekly more so webinar series uh, that covers special topics in real estate development. Um, you know, everything from financing to construction um, to, to uh, legal stuff, you know, with like your LLC and everything. Um, we, we basically want to focus on things that we can't in our training program, uh, you know, that we host twice a year and uh, the special topic that we'll be diving in tonight is is uh, about creating your development team, um, and that doesn't mean hiring employees, you know, to come help build your projects. Um, it, it's a, a larger concept that our guest Mike Stanton is going to discuss with us tonight, and he's coming to us from the How Group, a uh, a large development company here in Philadelphia that that he'll tell you about. Um, but before we jump right into that, I just want to go over some housekeeping stuff um, and and let everybody know. Um, who's maybe brand new or has never heard of Jumpstart, uh, what we do. Uh, we're a training program and a loan program, you know, for aspiring developers. Um, and we are accepting applications to our training program, which will probably take place next fall, um, or, or in the fall, September to October, around that time. And then we also have a, two loan programs um, where you can apply uh, for financing for your project to rehab and then, you know, rent or sell the project and kind of, you know, get you started in, in the development game. Um, you know, we're, we're very friendly towards first time developers and, and people who are new to the game and we want to, you know, help you reach your goals. Um, I'm going to ask Scotty, who is our, our co-op, and, and you'll probably see him next week. We'll, we'll introduce him on the Jumping Rs here. Uh, but Scotty's going to put the chat or, or the link to uh, our loan program info page, as well as our training program page, uh, jumpstartgermantown.com in the chat there. Um, so you can go ahead and click all those links. Um, but yeah, the, the other just last house, housekeeping thing is we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of tonight's discussion. So um, Mike and I here will we'll talk for about 45 minutes um, and get through our, our outline that we have prepared. And then um, all you folks on the call can, can submit questions using the Q&A tab, uh, which is on your Zoom toolbar there. Go ahead and type them in you know, as they come to you throughout our, our discussion tonight. And then uh, when we wrap up, we'll, we'll cover all those questions at once. Um, and you know, give you a chance to, to give some input. Um, but yeah, okay, that's my pitch and, uh, and that's the Q&A. And now I'm gonna quickly introduce Mike and, and we'll get, jump, get started into the conversation. Um, so Mike Stanton has been a part of the Howe Group since uh, before graduating college and he's served at various property management positions before moving to acquisitions and development team with Howe. And he has since been a part of the amazing development team that has overseen $200 million in development projects throughout the city, serving as project development, project development manager. And in his role, he is responsible for the oversight of residential and mixed use developments from the project's inception through entitlements, design, and keeping the construction on time and on budget. 
And that's what we're all about at Jumpstart is keeping things yeah. on time and on budget so that we can, you know, complete our projects, you know, within the loan term and, and make sure you're, you know, not extending things beyond. Um, so I'm really yeah. happy to have you here, Mike. And I know you were supposed to join us for an, another program and, and we're finally getting you on yeah. here. Um, so, so that was my introduction. And why don't you just say hi yeah. to everybody and tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, well, hello, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. As, as Derek said, we've been trying to kind of get together here for the last six months. So excited to be here on the Jumpin' R. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, Derek gave a great introduction, but, I, you know, since college, um, I attended LaSalle University. I did a co-op with the Hav Group. Um, we were about 100 to 150 units. And in those nine years since, um, we're up to 800. And come 2023, we'll be probably breaking 1,000 units. So um, it's been it's been crazy. I've been on the property management side and then transitioned to the development side and to see the growth. And, you know, everything that I've learned over those past nine years has really been something amazing with the Hav Group. Yeah. So which do you like more? Do you like the property management side or the development side? Where, where have you found your place? Yeah, de definitely love the uh, development side, property management. It was very valuable though. You know, a big part of owning and managing buildings is understanding the operations and what goes into them and, you know, the costs associated with them. And, you know, even understanding that making decisions on your construction and development side impact your, you know, building down the line from a maintenance cost standpoint. So, um, I was really happy to have that experience, you know, right, right from the get go. Um, and then to be able to kind of take that and transition into the acquisition and development side. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, are, have you embarked on any development projects yourself or, or done anything, you know, for your, on your own accord or have most of your stuff been with, with the How Group? So um, I, I've done one, I've done one in Brewery Town, full rehab, um, gut renovation where me and my wife lived in it for a few years. We since moved, but I do uh, keep it as a rental um for myself and definitely definitely learned a lot through that process um you know what's great with the how group too is we're able to invest in some of our projects so definitely taking advantage of that which is awesome um seeing the projects from kind of start to finish and be able to invest in them has been has been really great cool yeah i mean and, and you should certainly consider you know trying to trying it out yourself again it seems like you've learned a lot yeah. since the since you've done that last project um, for your own residence and uh, and clearly you're making yeah. it work with the How Group. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people on this call know the How Group, seen our signs. Um, for those who don't, we're, you know, vertically integrated real estate company in the Philadelphia area. And we do a few things in the suburbs, mainly in the Philadelphia area. But, you know, we have our acquisitions and development team, which I'm a part of, our general contracting team who's building all over the city. They've been exploding. Um, we, we then have a property management team. Uh, we have a brokerage as well. And also um, one that's really exciting is our How Charities, which is, is really something cool that, you know, we're able to find dilapidated houses throughout the city, partner with local, you know, community organizations to provide low income housing. What we do is utilize our relationships with all of our vendors and subcontractors to renovate the houses um, and allow these new homeowners to buy them at a discounted rate because we didn't have to pay for those renovations. And right away, you know, they're building equity and on their way to, you know, continuing success in real estate. Yeah. Um, so that, that's really cool. And lastly, we have a real estate brokerage that if we do out sale projects, they're able to sell. So basically we're able to keep everything in house. Um, which I'm sure everyone's seen a ton of signs throughout the city. Yeah, so. yeah cool. So, and, and I'm glad you kind of left off on explaining the whole structure and sort of like what the big picture is. Um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of these jump starters are thinking about like, that's what a development team is. Like, there's no way I'll never be able to achieve that, right? Or, or that seems like, yeah. that seems kind of like the ultimate form of, of what, uh, you know, organize, uh, an organization of developers can do, right? Um, yeah. But, but what I want to talk about tonight is kind of, building up to that, you know, like from the inception, how does someone go from being, you know, an individual borrower, an individual developer who is, you know, just fixing up one house, you know, at one, one house, one per year um, and selling it or renting it maybe. How do they go from that, you know, to take then start to take the steps to, to get relationships like you just described and sort yeah, of right. set up a, like a game plan, right? Like a strategy of, of who am I going to use? How am I going to use them? When am I going to use them? And, and that sort of thing. So, so I guess my question is, what is a development team, you know, to you? Yeah, yeah. So a development team can vary at all different stages, as you just said, Derek. Um, you know, our team is a lot different than probably the majority of, you know, the people on the call here, which 
I'm going to guess the majority here is they're probably one or two team members together doing these developments, whether single family rehab or, you know, single family or duplex rehab. Um, and, you know, maybe some investors that are kind of involved in it. So it's a little bit different where, you know, we have our development team internal to get projects done. Um, but at the stage where you're doing one or two single family rehabs, you know, your development team is a lot of your professional services, um, you know, your architects, your engineers, you know, the people helping you get to the point where you can take your project and, and get it under construction and then, you know, finish it and sell it or keep it, um, you know, whatever the project outline. So that's, that's really the core of your development team at that stage. Yeah. And I think the important part is that it's not just about the one project, right? It's about the next project that comes after that, or, you know, how they did on the project beforehand. It, it's sort of a, like a, a nebulous, like a, a loose uh, idea of, of, you know, employees or something like that. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah so, it's, so, it's a team. It's a team. Right. 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 So, so, and if you could just kind of like, uh, and I know this is what you just answered, but so I can further clarify for people, it seems like it's different from an organized business structure in that it's not people listed, you know, under your LLC's, you know, members, right? It's not people right. that you have, you know, you're, you're sending checks to or anything. It's, it's, it's like a, you know, a collaboration, right? Like, a, yeah, a, I think. The yeah, and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll kind of touch on some more of how that progression happens. But, you know, eventually it all comes down to scale where if you're doing so many projects and, and, and deals that, you know, you need to hire somebody to help you. Well, there's that, you know, calculation of, okay, well, I'm going to have to do so many deals and bring in so much development income that I can then, you know, have this person take on this role in doing that. So then I can focus on bringing in more deals and bigger deals. Right. Uh, but, you know, for the majority here, your, your development team is those professional services and a big part also is your contractor. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think I might have this question somewhere later on, but, but I want to ask it now. Um, yeah. Like, well, like what makes a good team member or what makes a bad team member, right? Um, like, like, how do you know someone is a member of your team as opposed to just someone who's, you know, trying to, to do business with you for any particular reason? <laughs> yeah, so, and I was thinking about this question a lot, Derek, and, um, you know, obviously we could sit here and say, look, everyone wants a win-win relationship and wants to have, you know, the right expectations. So when you're working with somebody for the first time, you know, you want to understand how they operate and how, what success looks like to them, what success looks like to you. Um, but, you know, a real just tangible example <laughs> right out the bat is, you know, money, right? Um, people are, you're signing contracts for services that they're providing. And that always is a big part of the transactions in real estate. So, you know, one of the things that we like to do and how it kind of all started was understanding people's expectations for, you know, how, how are they going to get paid for the services they're providing? So sitting down and having that conversation, just I'll take an architect, for example, and saying, okay, well, you know, when you, when you bill us for say our permit plans, right. And, you know, what's your expectation of payment? And if they say, well, we want to get paid the next day. And you say, well, I can't really do that because I can't draw on the money from my loan until two weeks is that going to be an issue, right? And, and getting on the same page from that aspect, I think is huge. And then if, if two weeks is too long, well, what else could you do in place? You know, what, what, issues, um, what issues can we help resolve outside of money that can alleviate this, you know, pain, pain for you, ultimately? Yeah. You know, a contractor, for example, of, you know, they do their work, they want to get paid within a week, and unfortunately, you can't get that drawn. Well, well, what if I can guarantee you that something that is a pain to you, for example, you know, every time I come on site, the house isn't ready for me, right? Well, what if I can help make sure that it's ready for you, so you're not losing a day's work? And then let's work that together. Um, because obviously, everybody can't just get exactly what they want. There's some balance. And it's tough for developers. Honestly, it's tough for developers because what you're balancing is not wanting to pay too much, but you also don't want to, you know, work with somebody that's not going to ever want to work with you again. And that's part of building that development team, which is, hey, look, let's, let's understand each other. Let's work on more jobs together. 
and let's figure out how we can best, you know, in harmony, pay and get the products done on time and on budget, like you said. Yeah. And it's a tough, it's a balancing act. Yeah. It really is. No, that's that's great. Uh, and I like the way you kind of like, like that, that's a strategy that someone can take, right? That that isn't like just dollar signs on a on a check, right? It's not. Right. It's it's uh, a way for people like Drumstetters in this call, right? Who, who might not, you know, have like large amounts of capital or or you know connections or the investment power to to make or, or to compete with other people, right? Or or to right. Kind of, like secure things in a way that that you know people from outside the city might. Um, yep. So it, it sounds like creating this development team is kind of just like like getting to know people on this, right? Like getting them to know what your business plan is, like the way you operate, you getting to know how they operate and, and you know, figuring yeah. out how you, how you can make money together, right? Yeah, that, that's right. And that's, I wanted to give that example of money because it, like all things, a lot of things come down to money, right? And if yeah. you be on the same page with your development team and expectations, you know, that that's a huge plus. And when things do come up down the line, there's more of that willingness to work together as opposed to somebody that just does not want to work with you at all, it's just going to be a, a dragged on headache. Sure. Um, so it, it, it really is important. And that's a big part of the development, you know, building that team and that uh, trust call it. Yeah, totally. So, and, and this is a concept that you brought up in our prep session and I think segues uh, nicely from where we're at um, and, and talking about soft costs, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'll let you give your definition of soft costs and I have some questions about it. Um, but, but I'm, I'm assuming it's related to what you just talked about, right? It's like maintaining these relationships. Or, yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. So soft costs can vary just like kind of the development team and, you know, based on the different stages of what kind of projects you're doing, you know, single family rehabs, maybe new construction or duplex rehabs, you know, your soft costs are those costs that you're not really thinking of outside of your purchase and your rehab costs, right? People might say, all right, great. I can buy this for 50 K. I can put in 25,000 in, in rehab and uh, it's going to be a budget of 75K and I only need to put 15 per, or sorry, excuse me, $15,000 in equity at 20%. Um, so, you know, those costs though that are missing are what we're calling soft costs. And a lot of times on these smaller projects, they're five to 10% of your total cost. Those costs are, you know, Again, depending on what type of project you're doing, your architect, super important to helping you get through zoning, getting your zoning permit, getting your plans together. Uh, structural engineer, if you're you know, doing some structural within the, the house. Um, environmental, depending on if you're full demolition or not. Um, so we, I mean, for us, we have a list of 25 different soft costs. Again, we're, we're doing soft costs at a different level, but you know, overall, it's that five to ten percent that you might not be thinking of to get your project to where it needs to be to construction and ultimately yeah. to completion. So let's compare that to a hard cost. Like, like if we were composing a budget, you know, what yeah. would be your hard costs and what would you put under your soft costs? Let's, let's just talk in an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so your soft cost is going to be your architect fee, right? Your your five to ten thousand dollars to put your plans together, draw up your duplex, right. you know, get it submitted for uh, a permit. You know, a hard cost is going to be your, your construction number. It's going to be your, your plumbing, your framing labor, your appliances, all the materials within your construction budget. Gotcha. So um, it, it sounds like they're, they're, you know, again, going off what we just talked about, there's an opportunity to reduce those soft costs, right? By, you know, building these great relationships with people and, and putting, you know, incorporating them into your development team, right? Is that, is that kind of what we're getting at here? Yeah, yeah. And, and an understanding too, though, of, you know, everything doesn't always go perfect. Um, you know, something might change out in the field when you're doing your demolition and, and you do need to do something structural now. So having the understanding of when you're sitting down with your structural engineer, your architect and saying, all right, well, if this happens, how are we going to handle it? How is it going to be billed? You know, are you expecting payment the next day? Because I obviously, I'm going to want to request you guys to come out right away. Is there an extra fee for that? So having that upfront conversation and understanding um, and again, same thing, Derek, right? Which is when, when you call that person, you, you want them to be able to be open and responsive to help you, right? They don't, you don't want them closed out and want to put them to the bottom of your list. Right. Um, so that, that's that important relationship there. Yeah, sure. And, and for a jump starter, for example, you know, who's like maybe submitting a, a new pro forma every week, you know, for a loan application to, to try and get a property under agreement or something. 
when they're putting in that that we're in there when they're creating the the construction budget you know with line items in the pro forma um their first time doing it you know they're not going to know what those soft costs are they're not going to know how much it's going to cost to get this architect out here they're not going to maybe even know what right what what if there is the need for an architect right um so i, I guess my question is like and, and I, you may have already answered this and could just reiterate but like yeah. strategies for maintaining healthy relations to the people so that when you do you know get confronted with that when you come across a project that oh wow i'm going to need a structural engineer um you know here's the, the person i go to for that like right. is there any strategies you have for people for for maintaining those because it, it's got to be a lot to kind of keep keep everything in your head and know who to go through for what and everything you know? yeah yeah no I, I well first i think if it's something new you're experiencing you guys have built this awesome environment within jumpstart right so why try to reinvent the wheel i mean my first call is i'm going to somebody who's doing it right now who's probably been through it and asking for some help. Um, that's going to be a response I probably give down the line here on this call. But I, you know, it's it's true. It's still a practice we do today. You know, yeah. we come across something new. There's always somebody who's done it or somebody who's you know going through it. Right. That's the people you want to be talking to. Yeah, you almost I guess you almost want to steal other people's development team members and get them on your own, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, look, I you know not not steal them because again that that might not be healthy for that relationship, but you know, be able to utilize them as a resource. And again, have that conversation. We've had the conversation with professional services of like, you know, how's your capacity right now? Are you able to take on more projects? And if not, is there somebody else that you might recommend us after you help us out on this one? Right, yeah, so I think that's that's really the, the tried and true answer to that question is is recommendations and, and contractors or- Yeah, and right, and anybody can ever, you know, on this call can reach out to me. I know right now for every developer on here, whether first time or kind of more seasoned, it's tough right now um, with everything, market conditions, inflation, you know, just got to keep pushing through. But, you know, there's, we're, we're all going through it. It's, it's top to bottom. Um, right. Okay. Great. Yeah. And, and I know particularly with uh, contractor selection, I mean, I'm sure there's people on this call who I've, I've had the conversation with, uh, you know, there people are always asking you know do you provide a list of contractors or do you have you know can you can you point me in a certain direction and um it, it really just comes down to what you're saying is is recommendations asking people on the street you know who who are working on projects yeah, you know, it, yeah i was just gonna say I, I love the way this was flowing right now because that's obviously something else we we're talking about but you know back when uh andy blum one of our partners was kind of starting our contractor division he was literally driving around to all the, you know, construction sites in the city and asking, hey, who's doing this? Who's doing that? Um, at the same time, I'm going to give the same answer, which is you know, somebody in the in the Jumpstart programs doing this, doing what you want to do. What are their recommendations? And then, you know, there's going to be times where you might get stuck and you're going to have to drive around and say, oh, that guy's doing stucco. Let, let me get his information. Let me see if I can get him to help me on my property. Um, so, you know, that's how we started. And same thing, going back to maintaining a great development team, you know, with a contracting team, you know, we talked to these subs and like, hey, what can help you? We, we said we will pay all our subs within two weeks, no matter what, right? And what that does is that then kind of gives them a little bit more of one loyalty us to, which is great. You know, we want to be a priority, but also, you know, things come up through development. I don't know anybody here that's ever had a, perfect, you know, no issues uh, development. And you want those guys on your team to say, Mike, you know, listen, this is what I would recommend for this issue, right? It's going to save me time. It might be a little bit more expensive, mm -hmm. but it might not take me a full week. It might take me a day. So you can get your project done, you know, five days earlier. Right. Um, that's, that's what you want to develop with these guys um, and, and those teams that they're looking out for you and solving problems for you that you might not even know yeah. right you know, you, that's that's the goal right um, right yeah so that's what we're, i want to get into next is sort of like the the like the benefits of having a development team i guess right um, yeah right because you you definitely hit on a couple really good ones like uh when you're creating budgets you want to know what those soft costs are you want to have relationships with people to to can fill in the blanks and such um, but like beyond, you know, just, uh, you know, people who are helping with the construction of your project or, or something like that. Um, what are some other, you know, uh, you know, what can having that development team do for you as an investor, right? Um, right. Beyond just a single project. So I guess we'll start with financing options. Um, you know, wh what would you say um, having a, a development team can help you in terms of financing? 
Yeah, look, have, having a, a strong uh, development team is super important in that aspect. And, you know, from, from financing, right, banks want to know that this team that you've put together, whether it's you or, you know, even us at our size of our group, they want to know that, you know, you're going to hit your targets, you're going to hit your budgets, and you're going to work through anything that comes through it in, in, in a positive manner and get that project completed. They, you know, what what kills real estate deals is time. So they want to have that trust that this group can get that project done where another group that, you know, they might not have much experience with, they're going to be much more likely to give you that financing because you have that, you know, background and trusted yeah. development team. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, and again, it all comes back to, I guess, that, that budget creation, like the faster you're able to make that and the, the more confident, you know, you can be with that and, and know exactly what you need from, from the, get-go your due diligence as opposed to, you know, after getting into the property and starting, yeah. starting to, to find out things. Yeah, uh, certainly. Uh, there. Like, like from the lender's perspective, you know, if somebody if submits a jumpstart loan application and they have, you know, the list of, of their engineer that they're going to have come out and the, their architect who's going to provide the plans and their contractor with the licensing or with their license right. number and, you know, it, it definitely, uh, it, 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 it's stuff that, you know, we could ask for and then receive at a later date. Um, right. But people coming out, out the gate with it and kind of having it from the get-go is definitely a huge uh, kind of like you know, like golden flag where we're like, oh, okay, this person probably knows, you know, where, where they're going with this. Yeah, and, they, and they've, they've spent a lot of time, you know, understanding this project, the team members that they want involved because, you know, they know that they're going to need to be involved at some point in budgeting for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, that's that's exactly right. Cool. Now, uh, and I think I saw one of the questions in the in the Q and A here ask about this, and so maybe we'll get to it later as well. But let's talk about contractor selection too, right? So, um, on your development team, you know, there's obviously an architect and and an engineer, maybe, um, and, and some other people. But what about like subcontractors and a general contractor, especially if you're not, uh, you know, doing the work yourself? Um, you know, what what is that that uh, selection process like? Like, do you want to? just have one great contractor you use for every project or do you want to have like three or four that you kind of play off one another? You know, what's, what's the, obviously it's, I'm, I'm sure a strategy thing, but, but yeah, what do you have to tell us about that. Yeah. So I, I mean, at a high level, I think it's great to, we're talking about building a development team and relationships. So if you find that right contractor, I wouldn't necessarily see any reason to try to, you know, take work away from him. Right. right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I can't help myself. I was looking at one of the questions too, but like you, you were mentioning kind of, you know, selecting your contractors, right. And understanding how they're doing a good job or not doing a job. And I think it comes to what we mentioned earlier was clear expectations from the beginning. You know, when you're sitting down with your general contractor and saying, all right, well, here, here's the scope, here's the project, you know, working through the budget, understanding one, like I said, you know, what's how, how's the payment going to be made what's what's your expectation right because if your expectation is you submit a draw or uh invoice and the next day i'm paying you well i don't know if i can make that work let's let's talk through that um same thing with the schedule i think it's very important anytime anybody is you know giving you scope of work for a renovation project you might be doing i think it's important for them to be giving you a timeline as well you know Timeline is is very important, as everyone knows. You're paying interest on the on the money that you have out when you're trying to get a project done. So every month that you're not wrapping the project up, it costs the project X amount of dollars. Um, and there's always that thought process in your mind too of, okay, well, you know, the contractor saying this issue came up, it's going to cost an extra X amount of dollars. You know, that might not make you happy, and you might say, well, you know, I I'm done with you. That's ridiculous it's $2,000. That's way too much. Well, by the time you might get a new contractor to come in and do that, you might lose a month. And depending on what your interest carry is, it, it might not have been worth it. Right. So that's you know, that balance. It might end up paying the $2,000 anyway. Right. <laughs> right. And that's that balancing act of the developer, which is never easy of, okay, well, what can I do to like help make this problem better for you? Right. From a contractor's perspective like what what can i do to help you i understand it's going to cost x amount of dollars you know what can i do can we work on the price let's get this done um and then now that guy you built that trust he works on your next job hopefully and so on so 
you know, overall to your question, you know, I don't think if somebody's doing a good job for you, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to use them yeah. on your future projects. Yeah, totally. Um, and, and I'm seeing questions stack up here. So I want to make sure we move through and, and have time for those. Um, I'm yes. just going to, my last question about, I guess, you know, advantages or benefits of a, a development team. Um, what about like relationships with the city or the community? Yeah. Um, you know, I know, yeah. I mean, uh, team members, you know, people might not necessarily think about neighbors, right. Or, or just people, you know, who, who live around. Um, but, mm -hmm. but that certainly is, is something people should consider right? A hundred percent. Um, I, you know, I know since I've been with the Howard group, we really pride ourselves on our reputation and our ability to, you know, the people we work with trust us. We say what we're going to do. Um, and we're going to do, do that. So, you know, it's interesting because it's super important and a real simple example is, you know, you might have a neighbor that is difficult to work with and you're doing a project and they might be mad that you're moving a trash can on and off a sidewalk. And, you know, you're probably right that it's ridiculous that this person's expecting me not to move their trash can off my part of the sidewalk, right? Well, a different approach might be, you know, hey, look, I, I understand this might be an inconvenience. How about I, move the trash can during the day and at the end of the day I can I can put it back on the sidewalk. You know, is that acceptable, right? You do your project, you get it done amicably with the with the neighbor. And then boom, a year later, the neighbor wants to sell or the neighbor wants to do something. And this little trash can that you could have had a fight about and said, you know, this is ridiculous. I don't even want to talk to you anymore. Instead, you had that open communication with this neighbor, they're like, hey, I want to sell, would you be interested? And then you're the first person they're talking to because they liked working with you. You did your job successfully. You did it respectfully to the neighbors and boom, you might have another project right next door. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, and, it's, it's, it, it, you, the way you describe that is the same exact way you would work with a contractor, right? You know, just sit down and, and talk about expectations and, and what you want, you know, what, what, what can help both of you and everything. So that's, that's a great example. And, and, and that, that little example can flow to, you know, as, hopefully people on this call are taking it from rehabs to new construction to maybe multifamily, 10, 12, 15 unit buildings, which would be awesome. You know, what you don't want is as you're starting that issue becoming an email or, or something bigger to the local RCO or the, or the councilwoman or man in that district that, you know, you have that on your reputation. You know, you want that local neighbor to be saying, you know, Derek was great to work with. He helped me in certain situations. He made sure the sidewalks were clean. And it's extra steps that might not necessarily in that moment be what you want to do or what you think you need to do, but it's all part of a bigger picture as you continue your growth as a you know developer. Okay, great. Um, well, I, I think my next question here was going to be uh, more so to like walk through a project and kind of talk about the different needs from, from you know, uh, inception to, to when you sell it or rent it. Um, but I, I think we covered a lot of it in our, in our conversation already. I, do you agree, Mike? Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah. I think that the last piece in here that we didn't cover so far is about marketing and leasing, um, which sure. is you know, another place you could have team members. Um, you know, how do you see people being able to, to help you out in getting your properties on either on the market or make them look desirable on the market, right? Um, yeah. or, or, you know, getting, getting renters and, and, and qualified tenants in there. What, what, yep. Yep. So again, it's, it's going to be a repetitive answer, which is, you know, get, go to somebody that's doing it, right. Um, go to somebody that's doing it and not just go to one person you know, go to a few different people, understand how they're doing, what they're doing. Um, you know, and, and you make a good point marketing leasing can also be a potential soft cost in your budget right so now you know zillow apartments.com to pay for their premium is like a thousand bucks a month if you're doing you know more than a three unit building you know that might be something you want to pay for in a month and it'd be great to include it in your soft costs or you're kind of paying it at the back end when you're trying to get these units units leased but but yeah look derek i think at a high level it's the same thing as what we talked about which is talk to people that are doing it, interview them, understand their process. Um, and, you know, talk to people in the different sectors too, you know, because legally you're signing leases, right? So you want to make sure you're covering yourself as a landlord. Um, so you want to talk to maybe an attorney that can make sure that your leases are correct. Uh, you want to talk to a real estate agent um, to understand the, the leasing procedures within the city and everything that's needed to legally rent out your units. 
Um, so again, it's, it's building those, those team members and talking to them and understanding what is needed. Great, awesome. Um, okay, and then I guess my last question and a half or so here uh, before we, we move into the listener Q&A. Yeah. Uh, I, I wanna ask sort of, uh, say, say five, 10 years from now, jumpstarting this call, you know, has gone through another 20, 30 projects, you know, they've, they've got their lawyer. They've, so. yeah, so. yeah. Right. yeah. They've got an architect they've used five times and they've got a, a contractor, you know, that they use for every project. Say, say they really start to get a, a, a good uh, development team. I, I want to know at what point does that become their business, right? At what point do those people switch from just being people who kind of help you get work done to, oh, this is the how group, or this is, you know, jumpstart development team, <laughs> you know, like, like, yeah, right, um, right. But when does, I, I guess, uh, or, or if maybe the answer is it doesn't need to get to that point, or it never gets to that point. <laughs> um, it, it might not. There's, there's a lot of people that are just kind of one, you know, one guy or woman show that are out doing developments and, and doing their, their projects themselves and are doing exactly what we talked about, you know, having all our professional services um, doing those projects. But I, you know, I think I understand what your question is. Uh, you know, you really start bringing in deals and doing bigger projects. Um, and look, that's a, that's definitely a financial question of, you know, as you start doing bigger projects, right. Um, there's developer fees, which brings income to the developer, um, which then can cover costs for an employee that might be doing what I'm doing, which essentially is, you know, I'm the owner's representative and, responsible for taking a project from, hey, let's do this project through entitlements, zoning, building permit approvals, all the design, you know, architect, engineers, through construction and through ultimate stabilization, along with, you know, all of our other team members. But there's that tipping point where it's like, okay, as the call it the owner of this development team, I'm more better off focusing my time on bringing in new deals and getting them to the point where this employee can now take them through um through you know the whole construction and stabilization mm -hmm. so that's that's and again from a legality standpoint when you start doing more projects you know you're probably putting them into a company entity you know llc or you know mm -hmm. developing your limited partnerships with your investors um but that you know that's all a lot more detail that i would be happy anybody on this call that wants to like talk through that more certainly happy to kind of go through that um if they're experiencing that and hopefully everyone does start to experience that that goes back to you know reaching out to us which is people who've already been through that and done that and understanding the challenges and you know what to look for gotcha okay great well that that answers my question there um and uh so I guess before we move on to the, the Q and A, is there any other like last tips or, or warnings you want to give people before they, they go out onto this, uh, in this journey of, of gathering people and, and getting them to work on deals together? Any, any last comments? No. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's awesome. It's such a fun experience. You're working with so many different people um, and, and understanding how to work with these different people is super, super important. Um, Cause everybody, Everybody works in a different manner. Everybody doesn't think like you. Everybody doesn't understand information like you. So, you know, it's really important to be open-minded and be positive when, you know, working through with all these different, you know, various team members. All right. All right, cool, Mike. That's a, that was a great conversation. Thank you so much yeah. for, for prepping great. with me and I, I hope people learned a lot. Yeah. I hope so too. All right, uh, we're moving here on to the Q&A section and uh, I'll just, Mike, read these out and you can answer to me as if, you know, I am uh, the person. Um, and if anybody, you know, hasn't answered their questions yet, be sure to go ahead and do that and we'll, we'll be sure to get to it here. we got plenty of time, so, so no rush here. Um, the, the first Raf or question is from Raphael and they're wondering, should you offer incentives to build a good team? So I'm sure you could do that in a, in a couple different ways, but but. Uh, is that something you should like, like, I don't know if that means monetary incentives or, you know, incentives like you were talking about where, you know, you know, yeah. I, I can move the trash can onto the curb or something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, doing the right thing is obviously important. There might not be any reward incentive for that, except for the fact that, you know, down the line, that neighbor is going to speak highly of you if you're, you know, going to do a future project. Now, you know, incentives to build a good team, uh, you know, I think it varies. Um, there's different situations where incentives might be, you know, a good thing to have, which is, you know, hey, look, we're doing this development and we need to get a variance of some sort. Well, if we get this variance with the legal team and the architect, 
you know, we might be willing to pay X in this period of time because that saves us six months of time and money. So that incentive might be well worth it for them to really have some urgency to get this where we need to. And then, you know, internally, if anybody is hiring employees, I think, yeah, it's always great that, you know, time, time is money and, and time is risk you're taking off the table that, you know, if you can find some incentives that work for both you as whether well the owner and the developer and the other team members, I think that would be great. All right, great. Uh, the next question here comes from Brenda and she was just wondering, how do I know if my contractor is doing a good job? And that's a general question, but I'm, I'm, sure, yeah. but I'm sure you have a great insight. So, so what would you say? Yeah, well, I think, again, one of the first things we talked about was understanding their expectations and your expectations. And I think, you know, when when somebody might be sitting down with a contractor and saying, all right, here's the scope of work. And again, the timeline, you know, I think the quality of work, um, I don't know if I really <laughs> explained that in detail on the call, but, you know, you're walking through the job and you can understand, hey, this this quality of work is is what I expected when you have this conversation. They're doing a good job. And then the timeline, I think it's reasonable for any contractor to give you an estimated timeline of, you know, where you want to be at certain parts of the project. And then you're monitoring that timeline. And again, things come up and the contractor might say, hey, we lost duty because we want to take this wall down and, you know, there's a structural beam that was all rotted out, right? That's, that's an understanding of a developer of like, I didn't know that the contractor couldn't be expected to know that, you know, I'm not going to push back and tell them they're doing a bad job at that point and say, great, what can I do to help you? Um, and then there's obviously the situations where they might be behind two or three weeks in the schedule. And again, it's the same thing of what's your approach on how we can help them get back on track. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, yeah. I think overall understanding, you know, from a budget standpoint and their timeline and tracking that is very important and a good baseline. Yeah. And, and again, you, you highlighted that, but uh, it's, it's up to the standards that you set yourself, right? So it's 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 almost not dependent on whether they're doing a good job. It's whether, you know, when you hired them, are they doing what you expected them to do, right? Yeah, and, and when you guys sat down and talked through it and you guys both said, here's my expectations and agreed to it, then that's, that's your baseline. Okay, the next question here comes from Lacenta and they were wondering, as the developer, do you participate in the contractor selection or does the owner procure the contractor? Um, so usually I think with our familiarity in deals, it's, it's the developer is the owner, right? You know, it's, it's yeah, yeah. For, for the most, for the most part, you know, the developer and owner, um, I mean, this is, this is, I can, I can again, take it much larger, but, you know, I think this is again, a, a contractor owner slash developer relationship thing, right? Like if you develop this relationship to the contractor and he might have one or two people that he knows he can get the job done, I mean, ideally, as the owner and developer, you want to be able to trust them that for this job, they're going to pick the right one that can help get this job done. Um, now, there might be other situations where, you know, Lucena might know somebody who hasn't worked with this contractor before and can recommend them to a job. And, and hopefully that works out because that's a win-win. Maybe they do it cheaper and, you, and Lucena brought it to the project. And then the contractor might get a new sub, which is great. Um, so I, I think... It, that's a very dependent question. Um, and then you yeah, have, for example, you take it to a huge high scale and, um, you know, on large project, there's GMPs where the owner requests three different subcontractors for them to select ultimately. Um, but that, that's, again, that's, that's super, super large, big, bigger projects. So. Okay, great. And uh, our next question here comes from Maria and, uh, I'll, I'll just summarize. Basically, she did her first new construction row home project, um, and she did the general contracting herself, uh, but had a lot of trouble getting responsible shub, subs, uh, so subcontractors that want to work on smaller projects. So her question is, any idea how to find good subs for smaller projects? Um, yeah, so, so yeah, that seems like an issue that a lot of people are probably dealing with right now. Um, and, and it's, you know, it happens on the bigger projects, too. There's been a ton of, ton of construction. Um, throughout the city and you know we know the labor um, is tight right now it's tough so uh, again I think it, it's reverting back to hey what what are some other contractors doing who are they using who they can recommend and it might also come down to you know going around and going to some of these bigger projects and seeing what contractors might be available and then ultimately again there might be a little analysis of you know you're trying to get it done as cheaply as possible well 
they might get paid 200 bucks a day by somebody bigger. Well, if you pay them 220 bucks a day and you can save a month on your project, which is X amount of dollars in interest because it's a critical path timeline, that could be something that you weigh in and that gives you a little bit of an advantage when talking to that subcontractor and understanding the nuances of, well, look, this time is killing me. I could pay a little bit more, potentially get them on my job and then get it done quicker. Yeah, so it's about finding that balance, right? It's finding what you're able to sacrifice and what they're able to, to accommodate and everything. Yep. Cool. All right, another uh, question here from Lacenta, and they were wondering, do you prefer to purchase the land or property and develop it or partner with an owner who brings that land or property to the table? So uh, that's hmm. a situation I'm not too familiar with, but <laughs> you might be able to, to help out. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question because um, we've, you know, we've done it all pretty much. Um, purchase the land flat out, property and development. Uh, we've also partnered with people who were owners who might have had underutilized, you know, assets that we can come in with our resources, which is, you know, help them through the process of getting the financing and what we can do on the, on the building and develop, say, maybe an additional 20 units on the backside of their property and then getting our construction team to come build it and then ultimately getting our property management team to come manage it and they don't really have to do anything except for maybe contribute the property. And it's a great partnership. But then there's other people too that might want to be more involved. And then, it, you know, it gets really into details in the sense that I'd be happy to kind of walk through any of, you know, those questions with you further as well, um, you know, outside of this call. Yeah, yeah. And for Lacenta and everybody else, uh, I'll be sending out Mike's contact information in a follow up email tomorrow. So if there's any, you know, more detailed or, or longer conversations you want to have with him, you can do so. Um, but yeah, okay. The next question here comes from, we're going to move on to Keith's. And he says, How important is it to have a post project debrief session with your team and subs? Uh, so is that something that, that how group does or that you've done on your project? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I think it gets to a point where, you know, we're working with our general contractor a lot, which is our how GC team. Um, we always, at the end of a project, we make sure we walk it when it's done, completed, you know, put a punch list together, make sure everything's to everyone's expectations, finished up. And then I think it's also really important to understand, hey, what things didn't go great? but what things did go great and how you can expand on that for future projects. So I think that's a, a really important aspect. And um, I think it's well taken by everyone involved, right? It's an opportunity for people to get feedback on, you know, how can we do things better moving forward as a team, yeah. which is important. Great. And the next question here comes from Shelly and she was wondering when building your team, who would be the person to look to, to ensure that you get a clean title, especially when buying from a wholesaler? Um, so that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that is a great question. Um, again, we've, we've had a long relationship, um, with a title company. Um, so I think it's important that you can, you know, maybe talk to a few different title companies that are able to do the right title search on a property and help you understand, you know, the background in the chain of title for something that could be a little confusing and, and difficult, you know, for you. I mean, I still get confused on a ton of title reports and looking at them of, is this an issue or is this not an issue? And, you know, your title company is really there to help you out and, and understand that. Yeah. And it looks like Lacenta followed up uh, with an answer or, or explanation. She said, for subcontractors, we use an outreach. We found some great subs that way and some subs have reached out or have been recommended from another sub. So what, what exactly, do you know what she means by that, Mike, about an outreach? I, I, I'm, I'm guessing maybe like an outreach to other other people building within the city. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. sure, but but again, that's our recommendation of, hey, let's talk to other people who are they using and, and get that outreach or go to the Jumpstart community to say, hey, I, I'm really in a, in a bind. I need somebody who's done well with drywall. Right. Anybody yeah. have any recommendations? So, so less so like asking one specific contractor for their recommendation. It's more so just like putting the word out there say, hey, this is what I'm trying to do um, in, sure. in a certain community. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, all right, our next question here, like I said, comes from, uh, covered that one. Next comes from Brenda. Um, she was wondering, what is a reasonable fee for a property manager? Uh, great question. Um, so it varies depending on the size of buildings. Um, there's kind of economies of scale when you start doing larger buildings, but I would say five to 10%, usually it's probably closer to 10% for single families 
in, in smaller one-offs um, for management. So probably around 10%. Great. Um, and let's see, uh, uh, Lacenta just followed up one more time and said, and outreach is where you host a public event and invite the contracting community to the table to meet and greet. It's a great way to build relationships. Yeah, it sounds like a great tip. Yeah, yeah uh, Lacenta, that's great. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, we're an active member of the BIA, which is the, the Building Industries Association. Mm -hmm. And we do um, events, uh, meet the builder. And actually, Gary, the, the partner of our company, his uh he's currently the president of the bia so i recommend anybody that's interested in learning more information can certainly reach out to me but yeah it's a great that great point and thank you for reminding me because you know we do meet the builders where you know contractors sit down and they get to meet all these different vendors that are looking to provide different services and new services you know technology within you know the construction industry is changing so quickly it's one of the you know furthest behind industries and this you know technological advancement so every day there's something new and i think that's a, a great way to get involved and, and learn new things awesome all right well i think that's a good place to wrap up um and thank you everybody for your, your listener questions um and, and mike thank you so much for, for taking the time out tonight and uh you know joining us for the discussion and, and being open for questions and everything i think I certainly learned a lot and, and I have some new strategies I can, you know, give, give jump starters when they ask me the dreaded question, right? <laughs> how do I, how do I con select a contractor? <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, and I, I know, you know, a lot of my answers might have sound similar and hey, don't reinvent the wheel. And, you know, we really do think that's a great way of going about it. Um, and, you know, we're always open and willing to help in any situation to reach out to me as, you know, somebody that's growing, if you want to, you know, hear more detailed kind of specifics of, you know, how the soft costs expand, more than happy to, um, you know, help out, you know, the, the Jumpstart community is great and uh, everyone I know is doing a great job. And so I, I really appreciate the time, Derek. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Mike. And and like I said, I'll be sending out Mike's contact info. And Mike, also, if you want to, if you remember to, to include the BIA information and I can, uh, you know, maybe add that in there, because I think that's a great resource that people should be able yeah. to. Definitely is. Yeah, I'll shoot you over uh, some informational links, I guess, that you can uh, probably include. Yeah, that's great. Um, and just a little heads up for everybody we have coming up here uh, on the 27th, which is in two weeks. Uh, we're going to be covering another very relevant uh, topic to what we're speaking about tonight. And this is a, a platform called Direct Subs. Uh, and it's basically a system that helps you find contractors for your project. It's like a LinkedIn or some online social media that, that links developers with contractors and uh, we'll learn a lot more about it in, in a couple of weeks and the, the founder of that uh, platform CJ Koch is going to be joining us to discuss um, and also uh, you know we're working on scheduling more jumping hours for May and beyond so stay tuned um, and keep checking back at our events page jumpstartgermantown.com um, to, to see what we have coming up. And lastly, all past Jumpinars, um, the recordings, both podcast and the Zoom calls uh, should be available at jumpstartgermantown.com slash library. Uh, I'll have this, this recording up as soon as I can uh, this week and, and you can check out all the other ones in case you missed them. All right, that's it. Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate right. it. And uh, yeah, no, thanks everyone. Have a great night. Yeah, thanks guys.